Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I am an alcoholic. My home group is Living on Traditions. We meet Friday nights in Raynham, Massachusetts, and my name is Anne Marie Hi. I'd like to thank the committee for inviting me down. Of course, I kind of wonder why I always get invited on Halloween. <laughs> I was told I should bring a costume. I traveled down with my buddy Tracy, and she said, I can go as you, the Wicked Witch of the East. I don't have to dress up. <laughs> Actually, it's the third conference I've been asked to speak at on Halloween. I always know how to look into that. There must be something there. My sobriety date is June 10th, 1983, and that is solely by the grace of God that I am sober today. Um, and... I would love to tell you that this morning I got up, as I typically do, um, celebrating a life uh, being sober, but actually I turned over and said some things that I couldn't possibly repeat from this podium because it said quarter of five and we were leaving at five. And then I went, okay, off to a great start, God, you know, and he had his little laugh. But we got here, it was a beautiful ride down, it truly was. Um, I am clearly suffering from severe fatigue, self-induced, of course. I can't blame anyone for that. Um, and I, I have to tell you, though, it, this is indicative of how tired I was. When we pull up to the to lights, we're in, still in Delaware, when we pull up to the lights and I see, Happy Harry's, Happy Harry's, Happy Harry's. And then I look at the next title and it says, Discount Drugs. And I went, What? Who in God's name would name a pharmacy Happy Harry's Discount Drugs? <laughs> okay, now we have a rule here. Some of you went out to dinner, I assume. You know, or you've come in for a long day. So I just want to give you absolute, total, ultimate authority. If the person next to you starts to snooze, push the sucker off the chair. <laughs> Just a little nudge. Which, of course, this rogues gallery in the front here will tell me that uh, they'll say, in Marie, that's a warranty five. Come to the action. Actually, the last time I was under the same roof with Mike, he, whom we'll be sharing later in the weekend, I went home and found out I was running a fever of 103 point something. Then at 3.30 this morning, it was about 102, and I said, this is the adrenaline and the excitement of being with Mike. <laughs> no, it's not. So let's talk about Tradition 12, because we have to start there. We have to start there. So if you have a problem with the fact that I have red hair and satin cuffs, <laughs> you have a problem with Tradition 12. Because you have just judged the personality rather than the principle. And if you were at a meeting today or yesterday or over this weekend, and you're saying in your head a little ticker tape is going like, you know, like CNN, da -da 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 -da, hopefully it's spelled properly, going across your forehead, because, oh, not her again. Or you start to mouth the words because you've heard a person speak before. Not that anybody would do that. And you say, you finish the sentence, you know, as you're going through, that's a tradition talk problem. You are clearly putting the personality before the principle. And I share that because it's the one tradition that I can tell you, um, I'll be dead at least 50 years and still will not have been able to master. Because I'm an imperfect human being. So, I don't know what you did for your summer vacation, but let me share with you how the joy of living and, and service gladly rendered, 
I like that big letter, I can read that. Um, has worked by God's grace into my life. Uh, Nancy's correct. 13 years ago, um, she and so many other people in Maryland um, crossed my path. And I'll be damned, some of them just keep sticking on. They just, you know, they're still there. I mean, there was a point about 12, 13, 14, 12, 13, 11, 10, 9 years in the past that um, I would actually go to regional events and people thought I was one of your past delegates. Uh, because I spent so much time down in the Maryland, Delaware area. Um, and I say that with love because those were days of absolute joy. Um, days of absolute joy. My responsibility is to live the incredible tapestry of weaving AA's steps, traditions, and concepts into my daily life. And that is the only way I know how to live sober to be able to stand up and say, and there'll be a quiz later, you should all have a little checklist. Okay, that was tradition five. That was concept four. That was step seven. Oh, page 76, that whole fear factor thing, which, by the way, comes wrapping around time after time after time. Is anybody nodding off? Give them a shove. Wake them up. My life is an adventure. Um, and and my joke in life is thinking that I have absolutely anything to say or do about it. <laughs> uh, no, no, uh, less these days than normal, I think. Um, started the year um, feeling pretty comfortable. Um, now there's a mistake right there. Comfortable, all right. Let's not put that word in there. And focusing on the 11th step, my life is, I'm at a crossroads. I don't know if you guys all hit that place, but I'm clearly at a crossroads both professionally and, and personally, um, hopefully not spiritually. Um, but I had come to an awareness that what I was doing professionally needed to change, um, at least in my evaluation. But I think God tends to agree also because these doors just keep flying open. And, and I'm just going to share with you part of it. This is going to be like a little essay. You go back to school in September and say, hey, what did you do for your summer vacation? And I'll say, well, I don't know. Let's see. Help the city deal with the fact that there were three murders of teenagers. And um, found out that after 11 years that, that I was going to have to leave where I was living, that word foreclosure you all hear about. Um, you know, just in case you want to get too comfortable in life. Um, you know, by the way, find a home for 3,000 teens, 14 to 19-year-olds. Sure, I can do that. Um, I was going along having a really good time in my life, I thought, um, just doing what I'm supposed to do. Service gladly rendered. Service gladly rendered. What I've learned in, in my sobriety and Alcoholics Anonymous is that I don't define where that service is and I don't define how I give it, just that I'm responsible to do it. Last weekend I was down in um, Connecticut, down to a district. What an awesome time we had. The theme was fired up about service. Um, and what I shared with them was my experience about how do I stay fired up about life and how do I stay fired up about living sober. And how do I stay fired up about really learning to dig deeper and deeper and deeper about, about applying those steps, about, a, about living the 11 step prayer, about not taking your inventory. Well, that's a hard one. All right. I, I don't do well with that one. But I suppose I can improve over maybe the next 25 years. Um, and being fired up about life. I am so drop dead grateful to be sober today. I, I know there, are, there may be some newcomers in the hall that when I say that I am grateful that I have alcoholism, that I know what it is, that I know it's a threefold disease, but God damn, we also have recovery, and I have a spiritual way of life to follow that gives me hope every minute of every day, no matter what. That is something to get fired up about. Service gladly rendered. I was 50 years old on my knees one day, Having trouble getting up off those knees, it's even more challenging today. And I was in a moment of meditation and this little voice went through my head and it was like, oh, you've got to be kidding, right? It said, and what is the purpose of your life? 
do I care? You know, it's like get the laundry done, get the grocery shopping done. But it was a moment because I didn't have a ready answer. I honestly did not, nothing, no smart remark came out of my mouth, no cute little quip came out of my mouth. It was, okay, that silence went a tad too long before I could respond to that. Within another few seconds, I can tell you that I was able. It was simply be of service to others. And what my sponsor has guided me to do is to not dictate how that service is given and, and where that service is rendered gladly. Because we all know how to render service. Now, whether we do that gladly and cheerfully or not, or we do it with a sulking, silent scorn in faces. You know, your face looks like you've stuck lemons for ten years. I just love being in service to AA. Why don't you follow me and be happy, joyous and free? Don't think so. But to be in service to others is why I'm here and I can get fired up about that. I can really get fired up about that. The opportunity to see the spark in someone's eye, whether it's a newcomer coming into a meeting, whether it's someone who comes to my home group. Now I have to tell you that a lot of people tell me they would love to come to my home group. I also would love to tell you that I don't hold my breath waiting because we work at my home group. We study AA's literature. We study the steps, the traditions, the concepts, the warranties, multiple grapevine articles. The first Friday of every month we read Language of the Heart. We still haven't finished it. can't remember when we started. It's been a while. Um, we, we read the service manual. We read the final conference report. We actually even send letters about what we see in that final conference report and go, what are you thinking at the time? Um, or we send letters and say, yeah, we support that. That's awesome. What a great way of, of stating it. So being at my home group is a lot of work. Um, but you're welcome to come anytime that you're up in Raymond. So service gladly rendered. Where is that service supposed to be? The spark in someone's eye in Alcoholics Anonymous or the spark in a woman's eye or a man's eye who's been dislocated, had their job ripped out from under their feet after 30 years and says, who will hire me? I'm in a classroom Monday through Friday and that classroom is filled with adults who have been dislocated. Do you understand the definition of the word? No home. No home. No sense of belonging. And so every day I get up and my joy of living and service gladly rendered is to bring to a group of people in a classroom the hope that we all have here in Alcoholics Anonymous to say, yes, you can. You can do that. Now, they haven't yet figured out that they're in a week-long 12-step call. And I don't, I don't feel the need to share that with them. Um, but that's what it is, and you all taught me how to do that. I couldn't do my job without Alcoholics Anonymous. I mean, I don't, I don't even try to pretend that I could do a better job without Alcoholics Anonymous. And that gets me fired up, just incredibly excited about life and about being alive and about all the simple, silly little things that are in my life that go on that gratitude list every night. You all do do an evening gratitude list, right? Whoa. That was a delayed reaction. I'll take that as a big no. So every night I sit because this little, she was maybe about four foot ten. Little puffy white hair that doesn't move. She could stand out on that ocean front, not a hair would have been out of place. I met her when she was 37 years sober. And she taught me about living. She was not my sponsor. She was a spiritual guide. She wasn't my sponsor because she thought I was cool. <laughs> and God's instinct said, let's give her someone else who doesn't think she's cool be her sponsor. Um, but Edwina taught me so much about living, so much about loving. She was the absolute first example I had seen in my life that I could remember of two people, a husband and wife, who clearly loved each other dearly with respect, with courtesy, with care. And up to that point in my life, at the age of 35, hadn't seen it, didn't believe it existed. And there she was in front of me. What a power of example. 
they both were, Edwina and Charlie. But she was my guiding light. She clearly was the guiding light to teach me about these things to be of service to others. She always focused on the 11-step prayer. And I said, no one can live that. And she said, no, but you just keep trying at it. You just keep trying. When you're tired, when you're feeling angry, when you're frustrated, when you want to just crash, when you want, when you want to do whatever you're doing, remember that that 11-step prayer says that's the one time we need to give back to others. We need to be willing to give the comfort. We need to be willing to give the, the ear to listen, not to fix it, not to interrupt it, not to find out why that's not appropriate, but simply to listen. I remember one of the first times one of my sponsees said, Are you still there? Did you fall asleep on me? And I said, No. You asked me to listen. You said, I need to talk to you. When you're ready to hear what I might have to say about it, I'm sure you'll ask. And then I'll say, is that a question? Are you ready for the answer? Because that's what the old timers taught me to do. They gave their service gladly. And I thank God for the old timers who were here long before I ever showed up, who gave me love. However, I need to share with you, they didn't couch it in nice little words and they certainly didn't worry about bruising my feelings and strongly suggest that I leave my inner child at home. So they said, did you drink? The old times were very clear to me. I don't know about you. If you want what we have, you do what we do. And if you see anybody nodding off beside you, shove them. I see a couple of heads going... You know that feeling? You know when you, you know it just snapped back? And, and like, did, it, did anybody see that? Anyway, I was just stretching my neck. You know, I just running out. You know, you were falling asleep. You were falling asleep. So the service gladly rendered that I, that I offer in that venue and, and during the day is because of the grace of God that you allowed me the opportunity for the last almost nine years now to work in this environment and carry AA's message of hope to people who don't even know that's what they need to hear. Um, but along the way about, uh, well I suppose I should back up and say that you know 11 step prayer thing service gladly rendered. Um, I was about 19 years sober and came home from a very long, hard day at work, and my phone thing was blipping off. I don't know why they make it do that. I really want to smash it sometimes, but that would be punitive action, so it's a warranty five thing. Um, can't take, you know, people, places, things, telephones, answering machines. Um, and, and the first couple of calls were from people I sponsor, and, and I sort of brushed it off, and the third call said, Hi, Mom. It's your son, Gary. Um, and he left his phone number. It had been 19 years since I had heard his voice. He was 11 when I last heard his voice, so I had no idea what it sounded like, and I certainly had no idea what he looked like. And that's what alcoholism did to my family. And we connected. And I stayed very quiet in, in the public venue, about my life um, before sobriety because it wasn't just my story to tell or share even though that might help others um, because if I was to share my story then it would also be the story for my son, my daughter um, and my former husband and I learned in recovery you taught me I had no right to do that um, I had no right to share the nightmare and the horror when it impacted other people and, uh, and God brought our paths together. Um, and I went through uh, family counseling, and um, we're friends today. Uh, we don't have a parental son, a mother-son relationship that you might consider the conventional kind. Um, but what we have is, is a growing and, and enduring um, caring about each other. Uh, it took about it took about a year, actually. He didn't say mom that day. It took about a year before I heard the word mom. Um, and it, it, it took my breath away. And that's because of Alcoholics Anonymous. That's because of the tapestry of weaving the 12 steps 
and being diligent about it, being passionate about it, being fired up about how can I learn to live better. The steps taught me about me. They did not teach me how to live with you. They never have, they never will. The traditions will teach me how to live with you. Or better yet, get involved in committees. That will certainly teach you how well you do or do not do getting along with other people. And so it may take several years of working within committees for you to find some peace of mind with that. And then when you just think you've got it, they change the rules. And you end up in another committee venue. Um, and you start all over again. And, and I swear, it's that ongoing challenge of continued spiritual development of that incredible tapestry. Um, and so after my son and I made that piece, and he came with a, a wife, which I found exciting. I was a mother-in-law all of a sudden. Now I knew all the jokes about mother-in-laws. I had seen all the TV programs about mother-in-laws. And I had no frame of reference. I had none. Except to render service so gladly. She came from a horrific household. Her dad had been a drop-down, violent drunk. Her mother severely impacted by his alcoholism. The very first night we had dinner together, the three of us, she reached across, grabbed my hands, and in tears, and she said, you have no idea how long I've been waiting to find a healthy adult member of this family. And my heart filled with joy. Service gladly rendered. You know, I am not her mother, but I'm her sounding board. God's amazing grace brought that into my life through the incredible tapestry of living and working the steps, the traditions, and the concepts. And how nice it's been that, because I know all the stories. I know I, how I felt as a daughter-in-law. Yeah, that was the recipe, except what did you leave out? Um, and to be able to love this young woman and allow her and encourage her to be herself, whatever that is. They don't want to do the holidays. They want to go off to the islands for the holidays. I say, hey, go. The whole rest of the family goes. I said, their lives, their choices, stay out of it. I learned that from you. I learned that from you. So the service gladly rendered. How can you not get fired up about that? How can you not, to be able to put my head down at night and say, thank you, God, for that opportunity. Because sometimes that opportunity is to, can you shut your mouth, Anne Marie? Sometimes that opportunity is your face better not fail you. Your face better not fail you on that. You know, um, my little buddy Tracy uses a loser, you know, little thing about, so she's working. She's working on it. She's working on it. She's better about it. But she also usually refers to my boss that way. You know, when I get into the car. And, sorry, but I had to admit it, this year at the tapestry, I was running up the stairs in the admin offices, stood at the top of the stairs before I went into the classroom, turned around and went. Sat to myself off, walked into the classroom, said, good morning, everybody. How are we today? We're imperfect people. We're imperfect people. Um, somewhere during the course, course of the spring or summer, I was, I was presented a situation on how to deal with three murders. Um, now, you don't come to Alcoholics Anonymous and learn how to deal with that. But because Alcoholics Anonymous taught me how to gladly render service, how to treat people with courtesy, kindness, and love, and how to listen, I was able to spearhead um, some work that, that pulled together some brief counseling for about 30, 35 young people, 14 to 18 years old who had witnessed a very brutal slaying. Um, I, I used to joke when I got, first got sober that I'm not even sure why I had kids. I don't tend to feel maternal, and um, God's idea of a joke is constantly putting someone else's kids in my life um, to remind me that I should treat all of God's people with courtesy, kindness, and love. And now to be working with now 3,000 teens, 14 to 19 years old, 
um, is an incredible challenge, and I don't know how I ended up here except it's God's grace. I have no doubt that the end result will be what it's supposed to be. Um, and so we put together um, <clears throat> those those people who know me well. I'm sure would never picture me at a block party. Um, and we were able to put together with absolutely no budget a block party for a whole group of teens who came to us and said, we just need a safe place to live. We just need a safe place to hang out. We need a place to feel a part of. Um, and we were able to do that on the riverfront in the town, I, in the city I live in. Um, and I don't understand their music. Um, we brought various components of kids together, and that is why I am so fired up about service gladly rendered, because it was all about AA. Uh, for the first time in my life, I had to deal with city government, not my idea of fun. I had to deal with school committee, government, even less my idea of fun. Okay, I just said that, didn't I? Not to worry, none of them that I know of are in recovery, they'll probably never hear this. Um, and to be able to bring the principles, you know, concept nine is about leadership. And it's about recognizing that you're going to have some pretty severe criticism, but also that a good idea can come from anywhere. And I would not have been able to work at the negotiating table and to bring everybody to be brought such diverse people together in the community who have never sat down at the same table together, don't even talk to each other, probably don't like each other. And I was able to do that because I learned in my home group how to sit through a business meeting. And I learned at my district meeting that not everybody is nice and not everybody plays nice. And I learned at the area level that people have very different viewpoints. And those viewpoints need to be respected, not attacked, not challenged. I don't know how you sit with your home group or in an assembly or in a district meeting, um, but every voice has the right to be heard with respect, not with the, ugh, it's him again. That's the tapestry. And so because I spent 25 years working with you in Alcoholics Anonymous and you taught me how to live, how to talk appropriately to people in government, whether you wanted to or not, and how to bring diverse people together to the table for a common bond. I mean, this was tradition one right off the table. Our common welfare came first. The safety of the kids in our community came first. And to bring them to the table, I stood there and I knew they didn't understand. I started to cry. But Ellen, did someone say something to offend her? You know, that would have been easy with this group, trust me. But it was, it was the joy of, oh my God, they all showed up. Service gladly rendered. I mean, I get so worried about this stuff. That's why I step late and get fatigued and get sick. Because the, the brain will go and say, well, what can we do next? What can we do next to carry this message? And that all began because one day I simply said, dear God, please help me. I had been introduced to Alcoholics Anonymous very early in my life. My dad was, my dad was a self-admitted alcoholic who went to the first meetings of AA in Boston. Um, on Newbury Street. He had a first edition copy of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. He had made his little notes in it, and it was all about comparing, not identifying. My mother almost threw it out. She said, is this important? First edition, first printing copy of the big book with notes in it? Yes. Um, I didn't drink as a kid. Alcoholism was in my family, but I didn't drink as a kid. And all of this background is what brought me to the point of being able to say, sure, I can adopt 3,000 teens, 14 to 19 year olds. <laughs> yeah, sure. Actually, sometimes they're easy to get along with an adult. Um, my recovery, I came into AA when I was, uh, very, when I was relatively young. I had my first drink not until I was 20. I had a value system. At that point, I had a, a career started at that point. I was a wife. I was a mother. I was a homeowner. 
Um, and in 15 years, AA brought me to, uh, alcoholism brought me to my knees. Um, and that's all it took. It was brutally violent. That's what alcoholism brought into my life. But you gave me hope. I came from that darkness into the light. You offered me comfort. You offered me a way to live that I could be happy, joyous, and free. And that constant spiritual search for that inner peace. I spent my whole life wondering what was wrong with me. I spent my whole life wanting to be a part of. And I never found that until I walked into my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous and you said hi. Actually, the woman who greeted me said, Ick Marie! I wasn't impressed that she knew my name. And I said, do I know you? She said, well, yes, actually, I interviewed um, to be your assistant a few weeks ago. I went, really? Did you get the job? <laughs> and she said, no, but I figured one of these days we were going to get you. <laughs> ooh, ooh. You know, not nice. I mean, God bless the woman who took me to my first AA meeting. Foolish woman. She, what do we tell people? What do we tell people on 12-step calls? Bring someone with you. You might be dealing with a wacko. No, she just trotted into an acute care psychiatric unit. Hello. Big book in hand. Said, I'm here, Marie. I'm going to take her to her first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I took one look at her and said, you're dead, sweetheart. But I went. I went. And I compared, just like my dad. I think that's the first time I ever said that. I did, I compared before I got in the hall. Because we pulled up and there was this group of guys. They probably were girls, but all I saw was a guy. Sorry, all I saw was a guy. I'll have to think about that one. It was a summer day. They were in leather. They were on their Harleys. They had studs all over the place and they had more metal in their ears than I thought their heads should tilt. And all I can hear is the nurse on the psyche unit saying, now, I want you to identify, don't compare. Identify, don't compare. And I looked at this, at this phalanx of chrome and thought, what am I doing here? And then I went downstairs to the meeting and that never to become my assistant person greeted me. Um, but I stepped into that room and I don't know how you felt when you went to your first meeting of AA, but I stepped into the room and I came home. It was the first time, I was 35 years old, it was the first time in my life I really, truly felt like I'd come home. And I wasn't happy about feeling that because it was very confusing. And I had been told I didn't have to say anything, it was an open meeting, and they were all sitting around in a square, and everybody got up and said, hi, my name is, and I'm an alcoholic, and then they said something else. The meeting was on gratitude, that's really not what I wanted to hear. And they all get up and they talked and they came around to me and out. It was like someone had pulled my jaw open, started to move the list, and I said, uh, my name is Ian Marie and I'm an alcoholic. And they all went. They all knew I was new. I can't imagine how, but they all knew I was new. And then I listened to one of these guys share. One of those guys who had the leather and the jeans and the chrome and the silver coming out of his ear. And he talked about how grateful it was to be a Saturday morning in the heat in the summer and that what he was going to be able to do after he left that meeting was to go pick up his little girl and he was going to be able to put her on the back of the bike and they were going to go for a ride because he was sober and alcoholics anonymous. And I hated him. I hated that he had what I didn't. He had his children in his life. The most difficult decision I ever made in, in, in my life, in my life, was to follow the advice I was given and that in order to get sober and stay sober, I needed to walk away. And that meant walk away from a 19-year marriage, a very high-paying job, 14-room country estate, and most important, my two children. 
Somewhere deep inside, God touched my heart and helped me understand I was not capable of taking care of myself, let alone anybody else. And I took that step. And God brought me to AA. I had asked him that night, didn't scream, didn't holler, didn't jump up and down, didn't throw a hissy fit, didn't bargain. I simply said in a whisper, Dear God, please help me. And he has showed me that path. He showed me that path through my first three years. How many people in this room are sober less than five? Show of hands. Okay, maybe we should skip that chapter. No. I think you need to hear. It's important for me to share. My first three years, um, I had a clinical death twice. You know, when you check out, they go, oops, she's checking out. Boom, comes the adrenaline. Had a brain aneurysm. Lost my eyesight. God's amazing grace was lost, but now I'm fine. I found and was blind, but now I see. Because I didn't drink, I asked for help, I worked those steps that the old timers taught me about, I lived those traditions that we are so mandated to preserve, um, and I have learned how to weave the spiritual principles of the concepts and warranties into my daily life. Mutual respect care and consideration in caring for others, service gladly rendered. And through that journey, you know, went back to work, enjoyed a good life, went behind the desk for six years to say, so how do you feel about that? That's after I was killing a psychiatrist, by the way, while I was on that acute care psychiatric unit. Why does God put little tiny people in my life? I don't know that. It's got to be a challenge, but this little twit of a therapist, sorry for them out there in the field, she couldn't have weighed 90 pounds, maybe, and she was the ultimate yuppie. She had a little lime green polo shirt on with a little round collar. This is back in the day. There's some of you out there saying, what little lime green shirt? You know, she probably had that little, what was that little animal they used to have there? That, and she was, yeah, there you go, all right, and she was in her navy blue little slacks. Um, and she had the audacity to ask me something about my children. And at that point, I threw a chair across the room, not that I could imagine you could believe that of me, ever being that violent. And I walked right up to her, put my hand on her throat, picked her up, and pushed her up against the wall. To which she said, and I said to her, and how do you feel about that? To which she said, never blinking, God bless that woman's heart, she said, I think you're ready to go out. I think you're ready to be discharged. What she had been looking for was some sign of emotion. Service gladly rendered. She gave what I needed. She helped me through that next step. And that's what you've always done for me. You've been here. You've been here through the good times. You've been here through the bad times over 25 years. You've helped me to laugh. You've allowed me to cry. You've allowed me to be absolutely obnoxious intolerated that. Um, God bless the first two or three women that I sponsored. They're going straight to heaven. No doubt about it, they had to put up with me. Um, and that service gladly rendered. And so that's part of the picture. I picked up a drink at the age of 20. Alcoholism brought me down to my knees at the age of 35. And the journey has been ongoing ever since. Um, to live happy, joyous, and free. I don't have time to waste on negative energy. I don't know about you all, but that's what my fourth step was about. That's what the fifth step was about. Freedom from isolation. Total freedom from isolation. But I have to, again, the steps are about me cleaning my house. I take an annual 10-step house clean, cleaning every year. I make a list of the significant people, places, and things in my life every Thanksgiving. And then I spend the next month or two writing about those significant people, places, and things. And some of them are still there, and, and some of them aren't. And some of them will forever touch my life with what they taught me of service gladly rendered and what they so freely gave. Is my life perfect today in Alcoholics Anonymous? Oh no. 
But is it enjoyable and is it awesome and is it wonderful and do I get fired up about it? Absolutely. Um, we had an archives workshop a couple of weeks ago up in eastern Massachusetts. It was awesome to see people get excited about AA's history, get excited about finding about the group's history, to get excited about preserving AA's history. And I hope you all feel that way about it. I went to Connecticut last week and listened to people get fired up to watch these district chairs talk about how exciting it is to do CPC work and, and cooperation with the professional community. Go out and talk to professionals about AA. To go out and, and talk to students about um, about informational presentations on AA, the corrections work and the difficulty that many people are having today doing corrections work because of the changes in laws and restrictions and remembering that those men and women behind those walls are waiting for us to come in and carry that message of hope, to get fired up about um, treatment facilities no matter how it's changing in the world. I fell in love. My first job in service to AA was as an area grapevine chair. Best job in the world because and, and if we have any grapevine chairs in here, I have to tell you, because you don't bring any threat. They say, okay, oh, comes the grapevine chair, and they're going to talk about this and that, because then you have no agenda. Your agenda is to just share this awesome tool with others. That was, those were the best two years that I had in service. Well, I shouldn't say that, but yes, they were. The best two years I had in service. I will say that, because that's how I really feel, to get fired up about living sober. My home group, group keeps anchoring me into that point. Someone push Robbie. <laughs> that was too good to pass up. That was too good. Um, so, coming full circle, can you see, that, and I did, I, it wasn't intentional, but that's the tapestry in my life. If I go back and reflect on what it was like and how I got here, that never leaves me. That's with me every day. That is with me every day. But then the challenge is, am I still there? And the answer hopefully is no. That I continue to change and continue to develop. That I continue to recognize that now that I'm in this whole new venue of the civic and, and community-wide environment, that the very things that I thought I had uh -huh, mastered in service to Alcoholics Anonymous, I'm learning all over again. And I, yeah, I go home. I go home and I'll say, okay, Amory, you probably could have delivered that a little better. You probably could have said that a little easier um, as we were coming down the pipe. Learning that if, if, if an elected official in your city had nothing to do with the success that just happened, you include them anyway. I learned that. I learned that. I knew it was like awesome. And we said, well, we'd like to thank the mayor for this idea. The mayor had nothing to do with it. But it, I, I learned that that was important to say that because that's concept nine in its best. Let that good idea come from wherever it came from. Don't have to, you know, I got to a point in my life in sobriety that I was so right, I was dead wrong. And then had to go back and make amends about that. And that's very important, you know, to be able to reflect back. And that's what the journaling and that 10-step inventory does for me every year forces me to take a look at my relationships with this rogues gallery, you know, and my relationship with so many other familiar faces that I can see here from Maryland, Delaware, and other places that, well, why haven't I picked up the phone and called? No scorecard. Well, you know, he didn't call me. You know, it's, I don't have to get over it. I don't have time for scorecards. I don't have time for negative emotions because there's too much to be done. There's too much awesome things that we can do with life and that I can do with mine. And I'm fired up about that because nothing turns me on more than seeing that spark in someone's eye that they were listened to, they were heard, or that spark that, I mean, do you ever walk down the street? I was doing it the other day. I was walking with two of my students. And I said, hi, how you doing? To the people who were passing, well, hi, how you doing? Eye contact, say hi. And they said, you know everybody in this city? And I said, I have no idea who they are. I said, have you never said hello to somebody? Do you realize that might be the best gift they get for that day? We have this little thing we do in August. 
and it came right in the middle of all this turmoil that was happening in my city and all these events that were going on that were not on my list of things to do for the summer. I silly person said, you know, it should be a quiet summer this year, right? No. And we get together uh, the third weekend of every August to, to share our experience, strength, and hope on the incredible tapestry. On, And it's become kind of an ongoing thing where you never know what's going to happen in the next year. And you never know what the topic is going to be, but it's from the heart. And I was so caught up in everything um, that I was doing for the community and for violence prevention and stuff that two and a half weeks away from this annual event, I picked my head up and went, I haven't given out any assignments, don't have a program, have not put anything into a place. Now, you all who were part of this planning committee, you probably started two years ago, have had more meetings than you ever probably needed. I'm so not a committee person when it comes to meeting stuff. And you know what? I just let it go. And this year's event was from the heart. And this year's event was so real. Not that the others weren't, but it was different. And it was like, wow, that's one of those things that was broke, don't fix it. And a part of that process was one particular person who just, who's not been a part of our life for more than what, a year and a half? But you ever, you've got to have someone in your life that you meet once and you just, that you feel like you've known them forever. And, and they, they just bring such joy to your life. Um, and just, just a few days after we all hugged and said goodbye, he died. And I remember I was in the middle of one of those community committee meetings, and they knew that I had gotten bad news. Um, but I need to share that that his passing was, we marked it with a celebration. Um, we all walked in like this. We all said, God, we're going to miss Andy. We left there an hour later laughing and crying, but mostly laughing because what was put together was a celebration of life. And when I went home, I really thought about that. I said, isn't that what this life's all about today? One of my favorite quotes is, and I'm paraphrasing, is birds sing after the storm. Why can't we, people, celebrate what's left after a tragedy? You know, why can't we take a look at the, the little... You know, the little bumps in the road. Um, okay, so the car got totaled. Maybe that's a big bump in the road for you, but, um, you know, or I lost my favorite ring, or, or someone passed, or whatever. And, and I know that the challenge I've found in my recovery to stay fired up and to stay really glad about service rendered is I needed to stop, look, and listen. Um, when, when Andy left us, and I had to really stop and say, have I said I love you? to the people who care? Did I say please and thank you to everyone around me, no matter what? And if the girl with the checkout line looked like she had had a hell of a nasty day, you know, did I thank her for whatever she did, even if she did it looking like she just smashed all a dozen eggs and a few other things, and she put the 12-pack of Diet Coke on top of the bread? Um, Am I gladly rendering service? And that's my spiritual challenge every minute of every day. Um, and that's hard work. But you know what? When I was told when I was really young in sobriety that if I made those spiritual deposits on a daily basis and I continued to do that, that I'd be ready for whatever happened down the pipe. Um, and so I'm, we're confronted with this problem. We ask these kids what they needed and they said we need to belong we need a safe place to get together and so we said okay and we, we had this thing called a shout out I had no idea what a shout out was I mean I didn't like the sound of it what are they all going to yell at each other you know I'm just not plugged into this stuff and so we put up the big easels and they started to write and, and they put down uh, improved transportation and the second thing a kid wrote was a teen center and then one kid said to the other Oh, no, cross that off. We can't do that. Now, I was walking away from them because we were leaving them to do it. 
Now tell a drunk they can't do something. You know, I stopped dead in my tracks, spun around on my heels. The kids went like this. I said, what do you mean you can't do it? How are we going to put together a teen center? And I went over and I scratched the thing off and I wrote in big letters, teen center. Um, and we went down the line. And I continued to give the service to the people that God puts in my life as gladly and as cheerfully and as lovingly and as excited and enthusiastic as I can on a daily basis. And last Saturday, we had 225 people registered to support and help us. And because we let the kids do the talking, the mayor made a suggestion, the school committee chair, who initially I thought was going to spit me out in 10,000 pieces. I don't like those school committee board meetings. If any of you are on the school committee board meeting, think about the people on the other side sometimes. Um, and we sat down at 3.30 last Saturday afternoon, and I sat in tears. We had a teen center. They allowed us to use an old gym. The school department gave us the furniture. The kids came in and cleaned it, set it all up looking like a little cafe. Uh, it's, a, it's a temporary spot for now, but it's what we have, and I can tell you that Having, being able to have a block party, being able to have a place for those kids to meet four or five times throughout the summer safely, having a teen center put in place, they landscaped the whole outside to a building that was being abandoned. I didn't do that. That was God's amazing grace. We expected a no, a no, and a no, and another no. And as a matter of fact, I sat there in such disbelief because of this tapestry we call our 12 steps, 12 traditions, and 12 concepts. And when they were saying yes to us, I'm still, you know, I see that on TV all the time. Someone says yes, and the other person keeps arguing. They said, we said yes. I'm sitting there with these two other people, and I went, did they just say yes? And they said, yeah, we did. Service gladly rendered. What could I, more could I possibly want? My son is a part of my life. My daughter, <clears throat> she might need another 25 years. She just may need another 25 years. But you know what? The blessing I have every night is I know where she is. I know she's healthy. I don't know if she's happy. But I know she's there. And she knows how to get in touch with me. I have a son and a daughter-in-law, and I have two grand puppies, two, a chocolate lab and a black lab. They're crazy, but I have a wealth of incredible people that God has brought into my life. So in the morning, I do tend to thank God first for my eyesight and then for my life, and I ask him to help me to be of service to others, to be of maximum usefulness and service no matter what no matter who. I don't get to choose. And I ask him to f save me from myself and then please save others from me. Because that's really kind of important to do um, on a regular basis. And I learn it through my day. I try to look at how am I living those steps and those traditions and stopping myself in, in being in charge of, of my mind in the sense of I have control about my attitude. It's the only thing I can control in this world is my attitude. Uh, can't control you. Can't dictate what's happening to you. I can see today not well once I was blind. I'm in reasonably good health, a bit fatigued, that's for sure. But I am so excited about life and about living sober. And I hope you are too. When I get on my knees tonight, I'm going to thank God for an opportunity to be of service to others, for the fact that I have good health, I have a roof over my head. Um, I mentioned that foreclosure. I've lived in this place 11 years as a, as a renter. My landlord said, I think they're going to begin foreclosing. And I went online to take a look and I said, yeah, that's 2 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. Um, and again, God's amazing grace. Alcoholics Anonymous wrapped its loving arms around me and I went from living in this little postage stamp to being on a lake where every morning I watch the sunrise and every evening I watch the sunset 
over a lake. And I just sit there in tears still and say, wow, thank you, God. I sat and looked at that ocean today and again said, thank you, God. What a gift. What an opportunity. It's the little things that really do count. It's the please and the thank you and I love you. It's not taking anyone ever again for granted. It's understanding we have this day and only this day because we may not see each other again. And I have to ask myself over and over, was it worth that little snide remark? Was it worth that little argument? Did I have to win that? Why am I sulking? Why am I being silent? I have this minute, this day. That's what you taught me the first day I came in here. That doesn't change. Thank you for my life. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.